In my last lecture, I described torque. Torque is the rotational analog of force. This then leads us to a new form for Newton's second law, F equals ma. How do we rewrite Newton's second law when we take torque into account and when we're describing rotations? So I'm essentially going to, it's not really a derivation per se, but it's a restatement of Newton's second law. I'm gonna first of all describe it for the simplest possible case. The simplest possible case is gonna be for a point particle that is rotating about a fixed axis. Once again, the axis is at rest with respect to an inertial reference frame. So then therefore the situation is nothing more than the following. So let's say that right here is a coordinate system like so. Let's say that right here at the origin is the axis of rotation. And then I have a point particle that is circulating like so. So here's my point particle of mass m. And then with respect to the axis of rotation, once again right here at the geometrical center of the diagram, the mass m has a position. That's the moment arm. So right here, is the moment arm R. And then let's say that a net force is applied to the mass M. Let's say that that net force vector looks, say, something like this, like so. So right here is the net force, and to emphasize it as such, I'll write it as F nut. Okay, now remember that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So what we want to do is we want to rewrite F equals MA here for this scenario. Okay, now let's describe the net torque that's exerted upon the mass m. We can do so by using the cross product. So for example, right here is the moment arm that I drew like so, and then right here is the net force vector. There's an angle that is formed between those two vectors. Right here, let's call this angle theta. So then therefore the net torque, we'll call it tau net, is equal to the cross product between the moment arm and the net force vector. So let's go ahead and do the right-hand rule first to get the direction of the net torque vector. When we do, we have R cross F like so, and the net torque vector then comes out of the board. So recall the symbol that looks like this, a circle with a dot in it that describes out of the board, and then right here is the net torque vector like so. Okay, now the magnitude of that is equal to R times F net times the sine of the angle. All right, so here's the magnitude of the net torque. R F net times the sine of the angle. And now specifically within this magnitude, take a look at this quantity right here, F net sine theta. What F net sine theta is describing is it is describing a component of the net force vector. That is the component like so that is perpendicular to the moment arm. This perpendicular component is given a name. It's sometimes just referred to as F perpendicular and we write that like this with the perpendicular symbol. So F perpendicular is this quantity like so, and then therefore the net torque is as follows. Okay, now what is F perpendicular? Okay, once again, it's just a component of the net force vector, but specifically it's equal to the mass M multiplied by the acceleration of the object. In this case, it would be the tangential acceleration. So let's go ahead and write F perpendicular as R M A tangential, like so. And now let's rewrite this in terms of rotational quantities. Recall that the tangential acceleration is equal to r multiplied by alpha, the angular acceleration. And then therefore we rewrite Newton's second law in the following way. Net torque is equal to r times m and then times r times alpha. That then gives us this so, which I'm going to write in this manner. Notice the mr squared that appears here in front of alpha, the angular acceleration. This quantity right here is given a name. It's a new physical quantity. It's called the rotational inertia. It's also sometimes called the moment of inertia. The rotational inertia is written as the letter capital I. It's equal to mr squared. Now, I'll explain what it means in more detail in just a few moments, but for now, let's go ahead and write the rotational analog of F equals MA. We can do so in the following way. Net torque is equal to I times alpha. Like so. And the direction of the net torque vector is then therefore the same as the direction of the angular acceleration vector. So in my diagram up here on the top board, 
If the object has a net force exerted upon it like so in this direction, then there is a net torque vector out of the board. Therefore, the angular acceleration vector will be out of the board. So the easiest way to think of this in terms of kinematics is imagine that the object is initially at rest, and then we apply this net force in this manner, and then therefore it starts to circulate counterclockwise on the diagram. Therefore, the angular acceleration vector is going to be out of the board like so. Once again, that's describing the change in angular velocity vector. Okay, now what about this new quantity called the rotational inertia? That is I equal to mr squared for this point particle situation. Well, first of all, recall what inertia is. Inertia is the tendency to resist changes in velocity. The greater the inertial mass of an object, the harder it is to accelerate. This is the rotational analog. The greater the rotational inertia of an object, the harder it is to change its angular velocity. In other words, the harder it is to give it an angular acceleration. But the rotational inertia doesn't just depend upon the mass of the object itself. It also depends upon how the mass is distributed with respect to the axis of rotation. The greater the distance that the object is from the axis of rotation, the harder it is to change its angular velocity. So here's a nice simple demonstration of this concept. And I'm going to use this stick like so, which has a large amount of mass that is taped to the end. Just think of this right here as a point mass. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to balance the stick on my hand like so, and then we're going to think of my hand as the axis of rotation. For example, as the stick would tip over, say, something like this. Which is going to be harder for me to balance? Is it going to be harder for me to balance like this, where all the mass is close to the axis of rotation? Or is it going to be harder for me to balance like this, where most of the mass is far from the axis of rotation? Well, which has the greater rotational inertia? the greater tendency to resist changes in angular velocity. The greater rotational inertia, mr squared, looks like this. Because not only does the rotational inertia depend upon the mass m, it depends upon how far away it is from the axis of rotation. So here, the mr squared is a big number, whereas here, the mr squared is a small number. So then therefore, it's going to be much more difficult for me to balance the stick like so because the rotational inertia is small. In other words, gravity could ultimately cause the stick to tip over that much more easily. So then therefore, as a simple demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and place it like so with the low rotational inertia. And then therefore, it's really difficult for me to balance it on my hand like so. Gravity wants to tip it over almost immediately. However, if I now do it like this, like so, then in this case, like so, it's relatively easy for me to balance on my hand with a little bit of practice. Obviously, circus performers are adept at doing this with like balancing spinning plates on poles and so on and so forth. So it's actually rather easy for me to balance like so, because in this case, the rotational inertia is rather large, like that, okay? Okay, now this is all just for a point particle. Okay, what about a distribution of matter? So imagine, for example, my turntable here, which is a rotating disk. How do you ultimately describe Newton's second law for a distribution of matter? Well, here's the easiest way to picture this. Imagine two point particles like so that make up a portion of a rigid object. So then therefore, I'm going to think of my hand right here as the axis of rotation. And then for this rigid object, imagine that the rotation looks something like this. So imagine that the two styrofoam balls here are portions of the disk from the turntable. How do you then rewrite Newton's second law for a distribution of matter? Okay, so let me do some erasing here. It's essentially the same thing as what I did right here, but we're going to ultimately have to add things up over all of the particles that make up the system. But let me go ahead and do some erasing first. Okay, so now we'll begin to describe distributions of matter. But we'll just begin here with a series of point particles, series of point particles that make up a rigid object. Okay, so let me diagram this out in the following way. We'll use my sticks here with the styrofoam balls as a means of conceptualizing it. 
Okay, and then I have one of the balls circulating like so, and then one of the other balls circulating like this. Once again, we have to think of these guys here as forming a rigid object. So then therefore they basically rotate together like so. They're, so they're not on their own individual tracks in this manner, if you will. They're making up a rigid object. Okay, now we've got one of them here, we'll say, and one of them here. Let's refer to this guy right here, for example, as M sub i, like so. So that's the ith particle for the distribution of matter. And then this ith particle has a moment arm. Right here is that moment arm like so, call that R sub i. And then we have a net force that's applied to this ith particle. It could be external to the system, or it could be internal to the system. Ultimately, it's an internal force within this system, for example, that causes this styrofoam ball here to undergo an angular acceleration when I start to rotate it like so. It doesn't matter if it's internal or external to the system in this context, we'll just refer to it as a net force. So right here, is the net force that is applied to the ith particle. And then what we do is we calculate the net torque exerted upon the ith particle, and then ultimately add it all together. Okay, now let's go ahead and draw the vectors. So right here is R sub i. Right here is the net force applied to the ith particle. Here's the angle between them. We'll do R cross F to get the net torque exerted upon the ith particle. So right here, coming out of the board like so, is tau net sub i. And then we'll once again describe its magnitude. So tau net sub i is equal to R sub i, F net sub i, sine theta. Okay, F net sub i times sine theta is once again F perpendicular. In this case, it's F perpendicular on the ith particle. It's ultimately describing this component right here. So here's F perpendicular sub i. So once again, everything is basically the same as I did a few minutes ago, but in just a few minutes, what we're gonna do here is just add it all up over all the particles that make up the system. Okay, so this is R sub i, F perpendicular sub i. Okay, F perpendicular sub i is equal to mass times acceleration, where once again the acceleration is a tangential acceleration. So this is going to be R sub i, M sub i, and then multiplied by a tangential sub i, like so. Okay, now here's where we replace the a tangential sub i once again with R times angular acceleration alpha. However, because it's a rigid object, the angular acceleration alpha is the same for all of the points. Therefore, we rewrite a tangential sub i as still r sub i, but now just times alpha. Everybody has the same alpha angular acceleration for a rigid object. So this becomes r sub i, m sub i, r sub i, and then multiply by alpha. And then once again, right here is an mr squared that's describing the rotational inertia. But then we add it all together to get the net torque exerted upon the system. Okay, so now, upon the entire system, the net torque that's exerted is equal to the sum over i particles of tau net sub i. So then therefore that's equal to the sum of m sub i r sub i squared times alpha. Once again, everybody has the same alpha. Right here is the rotational inertia of the system. So the rotational inertia of the system, if you're talking about a system of point particles, is just all of the mr squareds added together. Like so, and then once again, you get net torque is equal to i times alpha, or the direction of the net torque vector is the same as the direction of the angular acceleration vector alpha. Once again, it's the same series of steps as I did a few minutes ago for a point particle. Now we're just adding it all together. Now this is for a system of point particles. What about an actual continuous distribution of matter like my turntable, for example? Well, what do you suppose happens to this quantity right here, which I wrote as a summation symbol? Of course, it turns into an integral. So here is then the integral that is used to describe the rotational inertia of a distribution of matter.
so now let's say that right here is once again my coordinate system, right here at the center is the axis of rotation, but now I've got a continuous distribution of matter like so. And then what we do right here is we take a look at an infinitesimally small amount dm, and that dm has, for example, a distance from the axis of rotation that's the magnitude of the moment arm r. So then therefore, the rotational inertia of the system as you rotate it about this axis is equal to the following integral. So once again, the sum of mr squared, but now we write it as r squared dm, like so. Notice that it looks pretty similar to the calculation involving finding the position of center of mass back in chapter nine when talking about momentum. But as we'll see when I take you through some basic calculations of how to set up and evaluate this integral, there are some differences in actually evaluating the integral itself when it comes to what we did earlier with center of mass. We'll do that in the next series of lectures.